everybody. So welcome to our 11th Flow Seminar. So my name is Samuel Horvat and I'm a PhD student at Karls and I'm one of the seminar organizers together with my supervisor Peter Iktarik, Virginia Smith, Aurelian Ballat and Dan Alistair. So for those of you who are attending for the first time, let me give you some information about our seminar. Flow Seminar stands for Federated Learning One Word Seminar. And it was created as a global online forum for the dissemination of the latest scientific research in all aspects of federated learning. This ranges from like both theory and application and areas such as distributed optimization, learning algorithms, privacy, cryptography, personalization system, harvest and hardware and many more. For today's talk, it's my great pleasure to introduce you our speaker, Krishna Pilutla. So Krishna is a PhD student at the University of Washington, advised by Zaid Harkovi and Sham Kakade. Previously, he obtained his master's degree from Carnegie Mellon University, and before that, he was an undergrad at IIT Bombay. He is interested in machine learning and optimization broadly, and more specifically in the setting of structured prediction. And today, he is going to talk about ro robust aggregation for federated learning. Before we start, let me also give you some technicalities. This talk is recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel after the talk. Yeah, for the questions, Krishna is happy to take them throughout his talk. He will regularly post for them. And there are two ways how you can ask. So either pose your question to chat and set visibility to everyone or raise your, raise your hand. That's also in the participants uh, list and I will unmute you and you can ask your question yourself. Uh, now, I guess we are ready to proceed with our talk. So Krishna, please go ahead. Awesome. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction, Samuel. Uh, and also a, a big thanks to the organizers. It's, uh, it's good to have something like this uh, during a global pandemic. Uh, so, oops, sorry. Uh, so I'm going to talk about robust aggregation for federated learning today. This is joint work with my advisors, Sham Kakade and Zaid Hershawi. Uh, I will start with uh, an introduction and then I'll more formally state the problem. Uh, I'll then describe the robust aggregation approach. I'll go over some experiments and then wrap up with a discussion. And as Samuel said, please feel free to uh, throw questions at me anytime. Uh, I'm happy to take questions. All right, so I guess everybody here knows what federated learning is. Uh, in the context of this talk, I'm going to refer to distributed training of machine learning models on decentralized data, for instance, on mobile phones. Uh, the prototypical example is next word prediction on your phone's uh, keyboard. There are two aspects. There are two aspects of federated learning that I particularly uh, want to pay attention to. The first is uh, the aspect of privacy. Uh, because we are uh, uh, doing machine learning from data collected on uh, personal devices, the data could be sensitive. So federated learning requires that the data does not leave the phone. In fact, it was designed to ensure that the data does not leave the phone uh, at all. The second privacy restriction is that model parameters trained on a user's data are not seen by any other user or the server. Uh, and this is uh, achieved via the use of secure aggregation. Both of these together, I will uh, refer to as uh, privacy preserving. Well, the first requirement that data does not leave the phone is a given throughout the talk, data will never leave the phone. But when I say privacy preserving, I refer in particular to the fact that the model parameters are also uh, not revealed before aggregation with, others, with several other users. All right, the other uh, key aspect is that users are heterogeneous. From a statistical point of view, it means that the data distributions in, uh, on various devices are not IID. Uh, the method we describe here will be applicable to both IID and non-IID setting, but the theoretical analysis will be uh, restricted to the IID setting alone. We'll come to that eventually, but it's, it's good to keep in the back of one's mind that federated learning deals with a, a heterogeneous population. 
All right. What does a typical round of federated training look like uh, in Fed Average, for instance? It starts off with the server selecting a bunch of devices for training and broadcasting the global model. Uh, then each device performs the update locally. That way, the data never leaves the device. And finally, in the third step uh, of a round, the updates from each device are aggregated securely to update the server model. And because the aggregation is secure or privacy preserving, we, we get our desired privacy properties. In this, in this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on the aggregation part. In particular, in uh, typical uh, federated learning scenarios, the aggregation is performed as a weighted arithmetic average, which as we know from Statistics 101, is not robust to outliers. The implication for that of that for federated learning is that federated learning could be susceptible to outliers or adversarial devices which send corrupted updates. Uh, and the, the purpose of this work is to devise an aggregation scheme which is robust to corrupted updates. All right, I'm going to uh, move on to describing the problem uh, now. All right, so as I said, the goal, the precise goal is to devise an aggregation procedure for federated learning, which is robust to corrupted updates sent by devices and is privacy preserving because we already talked about how being privacy preserving is important for federated learning. So, there is uh, the, the privacy preserving requirement adds uh, an added layer of, uh, well, that's what makes the problem interesting because it's no longer the same as, you know, each device sends their model updates to the server directly. Uh, the implementation of a privacy preserving algorithm could require much more communication than simply sending the, uh, weight vectors or model updates to the server. And might also require, it might also be complicated to implement it in practice. Uh, it might be like a huge effort to implement it at scale. For this reason, we're going to require uh, two more, uh, we're going to require two more uh, uh, criteria. So one is that the aggregation is communication efficient. And the second is that it's, or rather the, the the second added criterion is that the aggregation requires a minimal engineering overhead relative to existing systems. All right. So basically we not only really want it to be robust and privacy preserving, but we also want it to be practical in this. So the way I'd like uh, you to think about it is to, well, let's, let's all put on our practitioner hats and think about what a production level federated learning system requires. And uh, these are the requirements. Okay. Now this may seem daunting at first, but the approach we take uh, in this work is to reduce, uh, is to reuse a secure average oracle. And a secure average oracle in particular is one that computes a weighted arithmetic average in a privacy preserving manner. So let's say that uh, each device has a weight vector. So device K has a weight vector WK and each device has a weight alpha K. Uh, and let's suppose the weights add to one, simplicity. So a secure average oracle computes the weighted average in a privacy preserving manner. So W1 is not revealed to any other device except device one. It's not revealed to the server either. And so we are going to try and reuse this in order to come up with a robust aggregation scheme. So the modified goal I'm going to state is that we want an aggregation procedure for federated learning, which is robust to corrupted updates, but also it can be implemented using a small number of calls to a secure average oracle. Now, we had four uh, requirements earlier, but now it's down to two. And I'm going to argue that the modified goal implies the original goal. So 
it's privacy preserving by definition because any communication from the devices to the server only happens via a secure average oracle, which is by definition privacy preserving. So this preserves the uh, privacy of any robust aggregation scheme which uses that. It can be communication efficient or it will be communication efficient if we ensure only a small number of calls to a secure average oracle. And third, we don't have to worry about all the engineering infrastructure that goes into building such a system at scale uh, at production level, which is handling stragglers and dropouts and so on. Like all of that has already been done for a secure average oracle and we can just reuse all that effort. So it's almost like we want to devise a drop-in replacement which fits exactly into the existing infrastructure. Uh, and I'll also comment that aggregation is now going to be an iterative process. Uh, it's going to require multiple calls to a secure average oracle. And that's because a single iteration is a single call to a secure average oracle returns only a reweighted mean. Uh, a weighted mean, as we know, is not, is not robust to outliers. Therefore, we, the, device, the aggregation scheme that we must devise has to be iterative. And this, so uh, this point is, uh, let me just, just repeat the modified goal again. We are looking for a robust aggregation scheme which can be implemented using a small number of calls to a secure average oracle. Are there any questions here? I can take questions. Yeah, so it seems there are no questions at the moment. All right, uh, very well, I'll move on. So uh, what, uh, let's, let's talk about what uh, kinds of corruptions we can handle in this work. Uh, the corruption model is as follows. So each device fixes an update before aggregation. Devices which are corrupted uh, might propose arbitrary updates. Whereas devices which are not corrupted propose uh, updates which are, you know, as one would expect, like stochastic gradient steps uh, on their local data. During aggregation, however, all devices behave nominally. So every device, including corrupted devices, behave as we'd expect during aggregation. Recall now that aggregation is a loop. So throughout the loop, all devices behave how we'd expect them to. Let me give some examples now. So here I'm going to talk about different types of corruptions and uh, from an adversarial point of view, the capability of an adversary to induce such a corruption. So the first type of corruption could be non-adversarial, non which comes from say bugs in a software system on a particular, uh, you know, brand of smartphones or a particular brand of hardware. So this, well, there's no adversary here. Uh, it only, you know, might record, yeah, it might, uh, there might be some bug in the pipeline. Uh, this is allowed as long as aggregation is uh, as we'd expect. From an adversarial point of view, if we have an adversary who can write data on the device, uh, then all they can do is modify the training data on a subset of devices uh, which are corrupted. Uh, but the modification on the data will be independent of the training of the federated model or the federated training. So this is static data poisoning. This is allowed under the corruption model. If in addition, uh, the adversary is, is also allowed to read uh, the current global model during federated training the, and write data to a device, then the adversary can read the data, read the model and, and modify the training data so that it hurts the global model the most. So it's called uh, adaptive data poisoning and that is allowed as well. If we allow the uh, adversary to write a model. So the, the model update, which is proposed by a device, if the adversary can control that, the, we call that as update poisoning. That's 
the most general setting we can allow in uh, our corruption model. Uh, so that's allowed as well. However, uh, if an adversary can uh, mess with the aggregation uh, as is possible in the Byzantine uh, adversarial setting, that is not allowed under, under the uh, corruption model I just described. In fact, any uh, adversary who can mess with the aggregation scheme, uh, we can't be robust to such an adversary by using only a secure average oracle for communication because a secure average oracle by definition computes an average. And if you, if you have any aggregation algorithm, which involves repeatedly computing an average, a uh, Byzantine adversary can simply uh, screw up the average each time round. So Byzantine robustness is not compatible with a secure average oracle. However, static and adaptive data poisoning as well as update poisoning are allowed. All right. Um, so I'm going to talk about the robust aggregation approach next. Uh, we have a one question. Yes. By Saeed. Let me just read it and I will also try to unmute Saeed. So maybe he can ask himself. So, so the question is, can you explain why adaptive is more dangerous than adaptive? Uh, yeah, can you explain why adaptive is more dangerous than update poisoning? Yeah. Oh wait, so this is the question that, uh, uh, about comparing about adaptive data poisoning versus update poisoning? I guess so. So sorry, it is unmuted. So please go ahead. Hello. Yeah, my question is why the adaptive one is worse than the update poison. Uh, okay, it is, it is actually not because update poisoning is uh, strictly more general than adaptive data poisoning. If, if I am allowed to write the update, I can simulate uh, what happens uh, upon, like if, if I can propose an arbitrary update, the update can be such that the uh, so such that we train the global model on this uh, adaptively chosen data set. So basically adaptive data poisoning can be simulated by update poisoning. Does that answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. In fact, even uh, update poisoning requires the ability to write the model, whereas adaptive data poisoning does not. So it, 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 it sort of uh, requires a, update poisoning requires a stronger adversary, if that makes sense. Anyway, moving on. Uh, if there are no other questions to the robust aggregation approach. So in this work, we are going to consider robust aggregation using the classical geometric median. The geometric median of vectors W1 to WM, uh, d-dimensional vectors with weights alpha one to alpha m is defined as the minimizer of this function G. Basically the geometric median minimizes the sum of L2 distances to these points. Uh, this is different from the mean because the mean minimizes the sum of, uh, or like the average sum of uh, squared L2 distances. So because there's no square here, it's not the mean, it's the geometric median. It's one of the generalizations of the univariate median to multiple dimensions. The geometric median is uh, pretty classical. It's known to be robust uh, since uh, way back. And one example is, uh, uh, Lopua and Ruzevu from 91. Uh, it's robust in the sense that outliers do not move the geometric median as much. Uh, because if I have one point which is very far away, uh, the mean will shift towards that point, whereas the geometric median does not. This is also extremely popular in robust machine learning, starting with the seminal work of Nemirovsky and Newton in 1983. 
Okay, so what makes the geometric median uh, very special is that it can be computed algorithmically with a secure average oracle. There's a small modification to a 1937 algorithm of Wiesfield, field which we call as the smooth Wiesfield field algorithm here, uh, which can compute the geometric median. Basically, in each iteration, uh, what happens is the server broadcasts its current uh, uh, estimate of the uh, geometric median z to every node uh, every every node then computes this weight beta k which depends on the current estimate z and also their local vector wk as well as their local weight alpha k so that gives their new weight beta k and then the next uh, iterate is just a reweighted mean where the weights are given by beta k so every iteration can be computed by like one broadcast and then one secure averaging. So that's nice. Uh, it satisfies our requirement that it can be computed using a secure average oracle. The second thing is that it is, it converges ridiculously fast. So uh, it's very, it can be, it's, it's communication efficient because within three to five iterations, we get an extremely high quality solution and often get an exact solution in a finite number of iterations. Um, uh, these are two examples uh, on two different data sets with two different models and a row is the corruption level. So that's the fraction of, or uh, the yeah, fraction of devices sending corrupted updates. So now we had two requirements satisfied. One is that it can be implemented with a secure average article. And the second is that it's communication efficient, which is good. Um, okay, so also here is a small visualization of the reweighting. There are on these two data sets, which I'll describe uh, in the experiment section again, there are, uh, every device has its own weight alpha k but then it's assigned a new weight beta k. This visualizes the converged weights beta k with the true weight alpha k. And we can see that the devices which are corrupted are automatically downweighted by the geometric median. Some devices which are not corrupted are also downweighted and some others are upweighted. Uh, geometric median does that, but it's more important that the corrupted devices are downweighted. So the, this tells us that it's a, it's a sensible aggregation scheme, the geometric median. This leads us to the RFA algorithm. So the RFA algorithm is a, is a federated learning algorithm where robust uh, aggregation is performed using the geometric median. Basically, all it does is it replaces the mean averaging of federated of uh, fed average with uh, a geometric median computation. And as I described earlier, aggregation proceeds in multiple rounds. Uh, and over the course of these, uh, over the course of these iterations, the, the weight of corrupted devices denoted here by these uh, double squares, the weight of these corrupted devices is automatically downweighted by the geometric median in a privacy preserving manner. Uh, any questions? There is a one question in the chat by mm -hmm. Arsani. I will try to unmute you. In the meantime, I can read the question. So mm -hmm. does the use of geometric median for robust, robust aggregation require IIDness? Is there any requirement on data distribution for this work? Okay, so it's a good question. I'm going to uh, come to that shortly. Basically, uh, to use the geometric median, you don't need any assumptions, like you can use it. Uh, whether it'll work or not is a, is a different question. So I'm going to move on now to the theoretical guarantees where I will, I will discuss this. If I don't answer this question by the end of the talk, or, in, or if I don't answer this question in the next four slides, uh, please ask me again. Uh, 
are there any other questions? So at the moment, no, we can, we can okay. continue. Okay, I'll move on. All right, so let's move to the theoretical guarantees. Uh, well, basically for the theoretical guarantees, we assume that the data distributions are IID. And I'll explain why in a little bit. Excuse me. So basically, the objective we want to solve is a, a, a weighted average of per device objectives, where FK is the uh, objective on the kth device. For the, for the setting of theoretical guarantees, we're going to restrict ourselves to least squares regression, where we are regressing uh, the features uh, phi of input x. So phi of x is just some feature representation of input x to the output y. And x and y are drawn from the same distribution p for all devices. And because it's the IID setting, their weights are all equal as well. So the feature function phi here could be, uh, say, a random Fourier approximation of a kernel or pre-trained deep networks or anything of that sort. Uh, the least squares objective is convex uh, and quadratic. More precisely, the assumptions we make are that F is mu strongly convex and L smooth. The features uh, phi are, are bounded by R almost surely. The noise variance is sigma square. And the fraction of the corrupted devices is half minus epsilon. So basically, if we have a small or a constant fraction of corrupted devices, then you can ignore epsilon, treat it to be a constant. Uh, but if the, if the fraction of corrupted devices goes close to half, then epsilon plays a very crucial role in the bounds, as we shall see. Uh, so precisely the RFA algorithm in this setting we're going to draw M devices uniformly at random, and the server broadcasts WT to each of these devices. Each of these devices performs NT SGD steps, uh, uppercase N, and then we compute an exact geometric median of these M updates to, to obtain the next uh, global model WT plus one. I'll just comment that the round T plus one T or T plus one do not uh, imply the number of communication rounds total because every geometric median computation requires multiple communication rounds for, and that's only going to be a concern for the experiments, oh, sorry, for the theoretical results. Okay, so what is the, the bound? The bound is going to depend on uh, a condition number kappa which I define as R squared over mu. That's, that's different from the standard condition number L over mu in optimization. Kappa can be uh, up to a dimension a D times worse than L over mu. And then as I said, half minus epsilon is the fraction of corrupted devices. We need the number of devices to be of the order one over epsilon square. And the number of devices, uh, sorry, the number of SGD steps in the first round to be of the order of kappa. And if we take, uh, if we double the number of devices, or sorry, if we double the number of SGD steps in every subsequent round, so we take two to the T times N, where N is order kappa, we take two to the T times N SGD steps in each round, then after uppercase T rounds of RFA with high probability, the suboptimality looks like kappa d sigma squared over epsilon n times two to the t. I will compare this with uh, the corresponding result of Fed average in just a moment, but I will I will pause here for a second uh, to to let you read the result. All right. So some comments on the, on the theoretical result. 
So the first, firstly, I'll say that it's the same bound as one shot geometric median aggregation. After, uh, let's say we don't perform any uh, communication throughout and just communicate once towards the end and perform the same number of local steps, it's, it's going to give the same bound up to log factors. Uh, that seems to be uh, the case in the IID setting. If there's no corruption, uh, the theorem says it suffices to use basically O1 uh, devices per round as per the theorem. Let's compare to the bound of Fed average in this setting, in the exact same setting. The, the bound of Fed average is going to look like D sigma square over N times two to the T M, whereas RFA was kappa D sigma square over N times two to the T. Basically, there are two uh, differences between the, the bounds. So RFA has this extra kappa in the numerator, whereas Fed average has, uh, is bettered by M in the denominator. So this, this factor of kappa comes because the analysis is performed in the L2 norm. Uh, that's because the aggregation is defined in terms of the L2 norm. Ideally, we'd want to, uh, for, the, for, the sh for sharp bounds with the best dependence on kappa, for uh, linear regression, we'd want to perform the analysis in terms of function values. So, I, I, I think this kappa can't be an avoided for geometric median, which is defined in terms of the L2 norms in the worst case. Secondly, uh, we can improve the, so there's the M that appears in Fed average. That M comes up because we are averaging M devices. Whereas in RFA, there's only a geometric median. There's no average in the sense of a Euclidean average. Uh, now we can improve RFA's dependence on M by doing a median of means which interpolates between uh, a pure average to a geometric median. So we basically take uh, buckets of devices, perform a Euclidean average in each bucket, and then perform a geometric median of these means. So because there is some Euclidean averaging going on there, the bound of RFA will exhibit a better dependence on M in such a case. All right, now uh, let me comment on the, uh, the assumption that we use IID uh, distributions. For the theoretical results, uh, the IID distribution is necessary because uh, it uses a property of the geometric median, uh, which takes like multiple estimators of the same quantity, uh, some of which might be corrupted arbitrarily and, and uh, gives a better, uh, higher uh, probability estimated of the same quantity. So we critically use the fact that uh, every device is IID and I don't know if this proof technique will extend to the heterogeneous setting. Now, when using RFA in practice, the geometry, you can use the geometric median uh, if you wish in, uh, non-IID settings as well. There's nothing stopping us from doing that. Uh, our experiments, which I'm going to come to next, show that in like realistic uh, non-IID settings where the data on all devices uh, is related yet different, then the geometric median does well. However, it, I would imagine that it's possible to construct pathological examples where the distributions are so different that the geometric median does not do well. Any questions here? Uh, I would have one question about so is it essential in your analysis that this geometric meaning is exact? Because that's not what, what you're using when you run the algorithm. Yes, so that's a good point. Uh, yes, in the analysis, the geometric median is exact. Uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure it can be uh, 
extended to a case of uh, approximate geometric median uh, with the right notion of approximation. So just uh, uh, using the fact that it's suboptimal in terms of the function value uh, G here that I defined, using that you have an epsilon suboptimal uh, uh, geometric median in terms of G, uh, is not going to be sufficient to give this result, but using the right notion of approximation will, yeah. We haven't Thank done you. it though. Thank you. So it seems there are no, for, oh, there is one. Yeah. Maybe, okay, so, so it's a, a question from Arsani. Uh, it's been shown in some paper that GM is not robust in high dimensions. Can you comment on that? Uh, robust for what? Is it not robust for, like, in what sense and in what setting? I, I'll try to unmute Arsani. Maybe you can yeah. comment on that. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. So uh, there is a paper, it's called uh, Little is Enough, which I'm referring to. It's, it's not talking about federated learning um, per se uh, setup. But this paper has shown that you can use, um, you can do some tricks in high dimensions to uh, to trick this, uh, like geometric median and other median-based um, aggregation rules. So I'm, I was wondering how does that apply to your case? Is there any tick here or there, or is there any assumptions on the dimensions that that you do? Uh, I'm not familiar with this uh, paper, and. Uh, I'll take a look at it uh, later, but we make no assumptions. And in the experiments, uh, they're like standard, like linear models, con nets, and LSTMs, yeah. uh, and it seems to it seems to do okay, as okay. we'll discuss uh, soon. So, uh, yeah, and I can comment that. Uh, the geometric median is not optimal for uh, robust mean estimation of a Gaussian. So the suboptimality of, uh, of the geometric median as a robust mean estimate uh, scales with the dimensionality. So if we are in a higher dimensional setting, then the geometric median gives suboptimal rates in terms of how well it approximates the, the mean in a robust manner. And there are better uh, estimators for uh, Gaussian mean estimation, which use like semi-definite programs and stuff. However, the whole point here is that we are approaching this problem from a, a like point of view of a practitioner. Some uh, getting robustness to some sort of corruptions is better than no robustness at all. And that's the whole point of the geometric medium. It's, uh, it gives some robustness. It, doesn't give robustness to all kinds of things, all kinds of corruptions. As we discussed, the corruption model also requires certain assumptions. So, uh, and the, more importantly, it can be implemented in a communication efficient and privacy preserving manner. So it's something that can actually be used in practice. And I'm aware of, uh, so this is the only robust aggregation scheme which uh, satisfies these requirements for federated learning, which I'm aware of. So you're right that uh, it has weaknesses. There could be better ones, uh, but um, you know, some robustness is better than no robustness, basically. Uh, Does that no, answer the no. question? Yeah, there was a comment. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you for the there question. No... Yeah, there are no other questions, so we can continue. Very well. All right, so I'll also mention that uh, in the paper, we have like a modern-ish uh, analysis of the smooth rescale algorithm to compute the geometric median. We can prove a, a global one over T rate by viewing it as alternating minimization. However, it clearly converges linearly locally. So that's, uh, you know, that's an interesting, I guess, uh, work that's still yet to be done. Okay, uh, moving on to the experiments now. Uh, so we have two 
naturally non-IIT data sets uh, for the experiments. One is EMNIST for image classification, uh, in which the input is a handwritten character. It's like MNIST, but it also includes letters of the alphabet in addition to digits. And then there's the Shakespeare data set for uh, character language modeling. So in EMNIST, all the devices, so each device corresponds to all the training data sets written by a particular human subject. So the data was collected uh, from human subjects who actually wrote the letters and everybody who wrote, so all the letters written by one person correspond to one device. So it's naturally non-IID in that every device, every person has their own way of writing letters. There's like flourishes and so on. But then they're also like not extremely non-IID because there can only be so much variability in how you write a certain letter. Uh, then the Shakespeare data set uses one role from one play of Shakespeare as a device. And it's non-IID in the sense that every uh, sort of a character has their own quirks and how they speak. So their own, their, the way they use language might change from character to character. However, the non-IDness is bounded in that they're all written by Shakespeare. <laughs> they're not written by different people. Okay, so on the left here is a plot which uh, looks at the test accuracy of a linear model. So just a logistic regression model on EMNIST where, uh, versus the uh, level of corruption. And the level of corruption is basically the a uh, fraction of, or the fraction of weights of devices which send corrupted updates. When we start with no corruption, uh, RFA is slightly suboptimal when compared to Fed average. As we increase the level of corruption, uh, Fed average degrades rapidly, whereas RFA degrades in a more graceful manner. Uh, and over here at, uh, say 25% corruption level, there's a, there's a difference of about 7% in uh, the accuracies of uh, these two methods. For the, well, I should mention that this is static data poisoning and for uh, the Connet and LSTM, in first the case of static data poisoning, there's not much uh, difference between the performance of these, these two methods. All right, moving on to performance across iterations. Uh, I'm going to start with the EMNIST linear model. There are four uh, parts of this uh, figure. The left top is with no corruption at all. Let's look at the test accuracy, which is the second plot on the first row. We'll see, so I'll mention here that we use three Wies field iterations for RFA. So the total communication of RFA is thrice the total communication of Fed average. And here we are counting uh, the, the x-axis x counts the number of secure average Oracle calls. So it does not count the number of rounds of each algorithm, it counts the actual communication cost. So we can see from here that uh, Fed average converges faster than RFA. That's because RFA is like, takes thrice as many communication calls. So for example, at 15,000 here is roughly the same as the performance of uh, Fed average at 5,000. And if we run it long enough, they'll converge to the same point. It's just that we don't see it here because uh, Fed average uh, has uh, exhibits uh, sublinear rates of convergence. However, uh, now let's move on to static data poisoning with 1% of the data being corrupted. Here we see that Fed average degrades slightly, uh, whereas RFA doesn't, it's basically gives the same performance. So after convergence, RFA would be slightly better than Fed average at this point. Moving on to the second row, these 
plots are for 25% static data poisoning. And as we saw on the previous slide, Fed average degrades quite a bit from 64% to about 40, 42%. Whereas RFA falls from around 64 to about 50, 52, over 50, just over 50. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I, I, so Fed average just sort of levels off at this point. Now on the bottom right, this is model update poisoning where uh, the model update that is proposed by corrupted devices is it's designed to hurt the mean. So it's it's so that after aggregating, it's go, the update is going to point in the negative of the direction that it should have. It's like artificially constructed to hurt the mean. And we can see here that uh, as we'd expect, Fed average and SGD just diverge here, whereas RFA gives pretty much the same uh, performance. Moving on to uh, the LSTM uh, sorry, model. Krishna. Yeah. We have uh, one question about previous slide. It's yeah. by Eric. Mm -hmm. I will try to unmute Eric. And the question is for this many uh, secure averaging Oracle calls. Is this a result using one batch federated averaging? Uh, for instance, Fed mini batch. Uh, no, this is like uh, the vanilla federated uh, uh, averaging. So each device performs, I think one epoch on their local data with a batch size of, I think it was 10, if I recall correctly. So this is, this is just a uh, fed average, vanilla fed average with uh, RFA where, which is like Fed average with uh, uh, geometric median. I'm I'm not sure what Fed mini batches. So yeah, the answer was okay. Got it. Thanks. Okay, great. So it seems you answered. All right. So now for the uh, Shakespeare LSTM plots. The story is much the same, except that static data poisoning, as we saw on the first uh, experiment slide, doesn't impact these neural networks very much. Uh, however, we still see that uh, Fed average becomes like more unstable. It recovers from these bad iterations, but it could like it could bounce around a lot uh, before recovering. And I should mention that RFA has like smaller, uh, it is also affected when a large number of outliers is selected, but it's more robust in the sense that it doesn't move as far away. And yeah, so that's the, that's the case he here as well. All right, moving on to conclusion and discussion. I think I already talked about uh, some of what I wanted to talk here. So let me uh, summarize first. So this work presents a robust aggregation scheme for federated learning based on the geometric median. Uh, it, ha it exhibits constant times the communication cost of Fed average. It has similar performance in low corruption settings and it's more robust in high corruption settings uh, from our experiments. And it's applicable in a wide range of setting in, including static and adaptive data poisoning as well as update poisoning. Okay, so uh, discussion, I already commented on the uh, IID versus non-IID setting earlier. Uh, but here I'll also mention that the same proof technique works for general convex losses in the IID setting. The reason we used uh, least squares and quadratics is because uh, in uh, the analysis of SGD, we, uh, it, it suffices to take a constant learning rate for quadratics. So it's just to make our life easier. 
what I did not talk about, and there was an earlier talk uh, uh, by Dimitri about, was about uh, backdoor attacks. So the goal of, uh, so our work was to, well, from the start, we were thinking about how to uh, protect against corruptions, which degrade the global model on the main task. Whereas in backdoor models, that is not the uh, backdoor attacks. That's not the goal. They don't aim to degrade the model on the main task. They aim to make the model perform differently on some auxiliary task. So uh, it would be interesting to see if RFA works. I haven't tried it, but I just thought I'd mention that it's a, a different setting here. Okay. Now, is RFA the best robust aggregation scheme for federated learning? Well, we don't know. It's an open problem. We do know that the geometric median is not optimal for robust mean estimation, added, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, it's suboptimal by a dimension factor uh, for robust mean estimation. So uh, chances are that the same might hold uh, for federated learning as well. Uh, as I mentioned, computationally, however, RFA is the, is the best bit that we have. So far, it's the only one which is privacy preserving, uh, computationally tractable and communication efficient. I'll also mention that uh, robust uh, FL has gained some attention re recently. There are works that use like clustering or outlier detection. However, none of them are privacy preserving uh, in the sense that I, I described just now. They all require inspecting the model updates from, uh, from devices. So uh, one word, uh, you know, if, if they're not privacy preserving, so they're not as uh, nice in that sense. Okay, so finally, uh, the, I'll, I'd like to compare uh, the robust federated learning with robust uh, distributed machine learning as it's classically uh, studied. So in federated learning, we average or aggregate weight vectors. In vanilla distributed learning, which has a huge literature and here is a small sampling of, of that literature. Uh, one is interested in aggregation of gradients. Now, both of these are, are different because under static data poisoning, somehow model, uh, aggregating model parameters is, is much easier. So here I have a 2D PCA projection of uh, EMNIST, uh, uh, of the EMNIST data set with a linear model. And even in a 2D PCA projection with 1% data corruption, it's very clear when aggregating model parameters what the outliers are or what the corrupted updates are. Whereas for gradients, even at 10%, it's not clear in a 2D PCA pr projection which uh, updates are corrupted and which ones aren't. So what we infer from this is that Data poisoning is uh, somehow, it becomes much more easier to protect against it in the, in the federated learning setting where we aggregate weight vectors. So perhaps it's time to rethink, uh, in the context of federated uh, learning, it's time to rethink the standard assumptions that one makes in a robust distributed learning, uh, which are typically like these worst case assumptions because it looks like in federated learning, it might be something which is not worst case. All right, uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll conclude. The paper is available online. The code uh, package and scripts are available online as well. It's based on LEAF. Uh, there is an implementation on TensorFlow Federated too. If there are any other questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, also, please feel free to reach out to me offline, if you'd wish. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krishna, for a wonderful talk.
Okay, so are there any questions? Yeah, so in the meantime, I would have uh, one question. It's mm -hmm. about uh, like your new algorithm comparing to classic feder federated averaging. So mm -hmm. for instance, like in experiments, what kind of step sizes works for, for your new algorithm? Is it like uh, bigger than like the optimal step size? Is it bigger than for federated averaging because you are more robust or, or the same or you have to decrease? Okay, so I did not tune the step size for RFA. I just uh, tuned it for fed average and I use the same step sizes for RFA without any further tuning. Okay. Okay, so Any other questions? Question yep. from Matthew Androids. Let me just, I'll try to unmute you. In the meantime, I can read the question. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. In terms of privacy, have you investigated potential leaks due to multiple iterations used to compute the geometric median? Uh, no, we have not done that. I don't have a background in uh, privacy and security, so that is uh, not something I know how to do. <laughs> but if you do, I would invite you to uh, give it a shot and let me know what you find. <laughs> 